You know, chances are you've probably heard of the phrase, when I am weak, he is strong. Right? I would imagine that you have heard that phrase in some capacity or in some sort of iteration. What I mean by that is you've probably heard it in a sermon. Maybe you've seen it on like something like a coffee mug. Maybe you've been to somebody's house and you've seen it hanging on the wall. Right? When I am weak, he is strong is a Bible verse that many Christians hold on to, especially in times when they are overwhelmed, tired, weary, or even feel incapable of the things ahead of them. You see, it is a phrase from Scripture that is remembered in moments of suffering and hardship. It is a, a piece of Scripture that we, that we would hold on to in, in moments of, of setbacks, unforeseen circumstances. It's also a verse that we would hold on to in moments of inconsistencies as it pertains to our Christian character, and even our conduct. Right? It's a verse that encourages us and lifts our head even when we are discouraged and have reason to hang our heads. But I wonder, I wonder, do we as followers of Christ truly understand what that means? When I am weak, he is strong. Are we able to fully grasp what the verse is truly communicating, especially on a deeper level, and from a gospel-centric understanding. You see, it's with this thought that I want us to focus on what, what the sufficiency of God's grace means. Because I wholeheartedly believe that the better we understand what God is communicating and implying by His grace being sufficient and strength in the midst of our weaknesses, the more solidified we can be in our identity in Christ while being continually empowered as we learn to continually trust him more and more, especially during the, the rockier times of life. You see, the key phrase from our scripture this morning is what Paul describes as something that he has heard directly from the Lord. And it is, my grace, right, referring to the grace that exists as a result of Jesus Christ, is sufficient for you. Right? That, 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 that line, my grace is sufficient for you. And it, it, it's, it's a good saying, right? It's, it's a powerful saying, but do we truly understand? Can we fully comprehend what Paul is communicating? My goal is that we would understand that and see how that is empowering for us continually each and every single day. The word sufficient comes from the Greek word archaeo, and it means to be enough. It means to be sufficient. It also means to be adequate with the implication of leading to satisfaction. You see, what that means is that it's not just barely enough. Right? It's, it's, it's not just, just a little bit. It's actually more than enough. In other words, it's not going to leave you feeling dissatisfied. It's not going to leave you asking the question like, is that it? Is that everything? Right? Sufficient means it's going to be enough. Right? And so it's not going to leave you wondering. It's going to actually leave you wondering, like, why is there so much, right? It's going to leave you wondering, like, why does God still show me grace, right? In the classic Greek, right, that's like the Greek literature and how it would be commonly understood during this time, archaea was used to describe being protected, warding off, and actually having the power or having help. And so one thing that we need to pay attention to uh, as Paul uses the word archaeo is that he uses it in the present tense. And that may not seem that significant to you, but it's actually quite significant. Because using that word in the present tense is, is implying that it's not something that is past, and it's not, something, it's not indicating something of the future, right? In, in, in other words, it would indicate that it's either past or something that we need to wait for. 
but Paul uses it in the present tense. And the reason why that is significant is that because that indicates for us that God's grace, God's divine grace, his gift of grace is something that is continually sufficient. In other words, it is actively present. That, I don't know if you can, you're following along with me. What that means is that it's accessible. What that means is that it's readily available. It's not, it's not saying that, oh man, like that opportunity passed, now i got to wait another six months for God's grace to reappear. That's not what it's saying. The sufficiency of God's grace means that it is readily available and accessible to each and every single person who would call upon the name of Jesus Christ as not only Lord, but Savior. And so the very thing that we are undeserving of because of our sinful nature is, is the very thing that is still actively present, even in the midst of what? Our sinfulness and even our weaknesses. God's grace being sufficient isn't something that's readily available to you because you've been doing good. right? God's grace is not something that's readily available to you because you've earned it or you've achieved it. Right, from a gospel-centric understanding, God's grace is something that is what? Freely given to whom? To you. So in other words, when it comes to God's grace, right, there's never a shortage. Right? It is present in the midst of what is going on today. But here's the thing. It will not be taken away because of our inconsistencies. God's grace will not be withheld from us because we've had some shortcomings. Instead, that is encouraging for you and I because it calls for us to continually look to Christ, to place our faith in him, and it will be continually, abundantly available. God's grace is sufficient. Right? It is sufficient in the sense that grace and right, in favor and right, the love of God it is, the, it is the favor and love of God in action, continual action. God's grace is sufficient in the sense that not only does it serve as a reminder that God loves us, but it reminds us of where it comes from. It comes from a place of what? Of love. Why? Because who loved us first? Well, I didn't love God first, but God loved us first. That's God's grace. And so the, so the sufficiency of God's grace also testifies that it is presently active and available. Right? We don't wait upon it. It's already there waiting on you. Does that make sense? And so that now that we've established in a greater sense how God's grace is sufficient, let us use that perspective, right, that lens to see how God's grace has been sufficient for somebody like Paul. Who, somebody who we admire, we look up to, and we, who has a good track record. Right? What Paul says is trustworthy. But we can see how God's grace has been sufficient for Paul in the midst of his own trials and his own sufferings. And what, what that does for us is that we can see how that can be empowering, encouraging, and even affirming for us as we go through our fair share of, of trials, suffering, and even moments where we feel like, man, like, I've done some bad stuff. I don't think God can love me. Maybe you've been there. Right? Maybe, you, maybe you're, you're haunted by your, your own guilt. You say, like, man, like, why does God love? I, I, don't, I don't deserve God's love. And, you know, obviously that's Satan talking, right, whispering in, in your ear. But the reality of the sufficiency of God's grace is that you can't be disqualified from it, right? Because why? It's a gift. And that gift is something that is so accessible, even in the moments of our weakest moments, even when we feel inadequate, even when we feel like we are so undeserving. And so for us, as we look at Paul and his dialogue about how God's grace has been sufficient for him, well, well guess what? then God's grace should be sufficient for who? For us, right? And so using our scripture today, I think there are at least four instances where we can learn from Paul and see how God's grace is sufficient 
in our own lives. And so because of the sufficiency of God's grace, right, because God's grace exists, because it's there abundantly, right, I believe that God's grace allows for us to actually take a step back so that we can push Christ to be brought forth. Right, that's number one. Right? Number one is God's grace allows for us to take a step back so that Jesus can be brought forward. You see, because of God's grace, or because God's grace is sufficient in our lives, and because that establishes us and actually covers us, there's no need for us to actually step forward to boast about who we are, highlighting our accomplishments or even our accolades. Right? We are, we are saved because of what? God's love and God's grace, not by our merits. And so a verse I, I would imagine that many of us are familiar with, and it's not up there, but it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? That, and it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is what? The gift of God, not a result of works so that what? No one may boast. Right? It's not a result of our works, but it's a result of God's love for us. That's actually what we want to push forward to the forefront of, of, of who we are. Right? We, when, when it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to being a light in this world, like you don't want to step forward and say, hey, look at me. Hey, check me out. No, but we want to say, hey, look at what God has done. Look at what God is doing. Look at what God is capable of doing in our lives. And so if we look at verses 5 to 6 uh, this morning, right, if we look at our, our verses for today, this is what Paul writes. He says, on behalf, of this man, I will, on behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of what? My weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But what? What does he say? I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees me in or hears from me. And so when we think about Paul, right, we have to think about what it's like to live like Paul during this time. Think about what, what it was like to be Paul and the things that he had to go through to, you know, prove himself or to establish himself as someone who truly came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because I am pretty sure there were plenty of times that Paul would go to certain places and people wouldn't take him seriously. Maybe in the early part of his ministry. After he had come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, after being blinded on the road to Damascus. And the moment he shows up on the scene, like, trying to talk the, the Jesus lingo, trying to share the gospel, people are looking dumbfounded. Like, they're looking confused, like, who is this guy? Right, aren't, you, aren't you Saul? Right, I would imagine that there are people who would constantly question his character or even feared him because of his past. And naturally, our response in a situation like that, right, if, if someone has ever questioned you or doubted you, what, what is our, our instinct? We become defensive. We, 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 we say, hold on now. And what do we start to do? We start to defend ourselves. And I would imagine that for Paul, he could have easily responded by saying, like, do you not know who I am? I feel like some of us in our pride, we say that, right? Do you not do you not know who I am? Or maybe we said, do you not know what I've done for the church, right? Especially if you're a Paul. Like, he could have easily been like, well, what have you done? He could have easily been like, man, have you ever, have you ever been arrested for the gospel? You've, you ever been beat because you shared the gospel? No? All right, then that's what I thought. But that's something that Paul could have easily done. He could have been like, have you, ever been, have you ever been beaten because of your faith and identity in Jesus Christ? And Paul, more than anybody, could have been like, have you done more than I have? Right? That could have easily silenced any of his haters, any of his naysayers. But that's not how Paul responds. Even though that's probably how we want to respond. We might say to, our, to the person, like, how long have you been a member of New Life Church? Well, I, I've been here since before this building was here. Like, what have you done for this church? I've done, I, you know how many times I've set up chairs and cleaned up the bathrooms? You know how many times I've served in the kitchen? And we, we try to stick our chests out because we want to prove ourselves. We want to make ourselves feel higher and better than the person that we're trying to belittle. But Paul says, you don't got to do that. 
Right? Paul says, I could, I could have easily, I could have easily silenced those that were hating against me. But I didn't. Why? Because he said, this was my opportunity to take a step back so that Christ could be seen. You see, church, that is how the sufficiency of God's grace works in us and empowers us. God's grace positions us in, in a place to where we don't have to have the recognition. We don't need the spotlight. We don't have to prove ourselves based off of our track record and the things that we've done. Instead, we see our weaknesses or even our moments of tribulation and suffering as an opportunity to say, hey, don't look at me. I need you to see Christ. Right? It actually allows us to have peace. And that's a key thing. Because in the moment of being offended, right, we become so defensive, we feel like our pride and our identity is being attacked. But the way that God's grace covers us and the way that it is so sufficient, it allows us to hear those, those hurtful things. It allows us to be in those moments where we, we don't feel appreciated and to be okay. That's how sufficient God's grace is. And Paul says, like, I, I, don't, I don't want to be seen. I, 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 I could have I listed everything that I've done, but I didn't need to. Why? Because I need them to see Christ in me. So I take the step back so that I can push Christ forward even more. See, because God's grace is sufficient, we don't need to list our accomplishments or even relish in our accolades to prove ourselves and to prove our worth. We can simply look to God and give him praise for all that he is doing in our lives. Because of God's grace, right, we can give credit where credit is truly due. Because what? This is God's doing. This is God's working in our lives. This is not of ourselves, but this has everything to do with God. And so we want the people to see what? Not us, but we want them to see God. Amen? The second thing is this, right? The sufficiency of God's grace, right? Because of God's grace... We can be harassed, but still be covered. Right? We can be harassed, but still be c covered. Right? Let, me let, let me let you in on a little secret. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're safe from criticism, hardships, or suffering. I hate to break it to you. Right? Just because you're saved doesn't mean life is going to be smooth sailing into the sunset. Right? If anything, being saved, knowing the gospel, confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior can actually put a target on you like, oh, so-and-so is a Christian. Let me see if I can break you. Oh, you know Jesus now? You want to follow Jesus? Let me see if I can lead you away from Jesus. Right? Because of the gospel, there is a target on your back, front, side, all on your whole being. And that's okay. Because we can be harassed and still be covered in God's grace. You see, the reality of our lives is that Satan is looking to do anything and everything in his power to make us trust God less and less. Right? He wants us to, to look at our circumstances, look at our weakness and go, yeah, I am not good enough. Oh, I'm so undeserving. That would make Satan so happy for us to begin to doubt what God is doing and has done in our lives. But, you know, and Scripture actually describes Satan as being like a lion, looking to what? Devour. Devour its prey. Why? Because you and I, we belong to Christ, and we're trying to follow him faithfully, right? And that makes us a target for Satan's schemes. If we look at verses 7 to 8 together, Right, Paul continues to write, he says, so to keep me from becoming conceited or you know, arrogant or full of himself right, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, so the things that he knew and understand about God and the things that God had planned and things that were coming for creation. Right? And obviously we don't know what they are, but Paul, Paul was convicted by it. He says, what? A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of whom? Satan. To what? Harass me. To keep me from becoming conceited. And three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. You see, Paul mentions that a thorn was given me in the flesh. 
a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And that Paul pleaded with God three times for it to leave him until he finally came to the conclusion that what? He was covered. He was covered in God's grace. And so the thing that we have to understand is that what this thorn is, we actually don't know. Theologians debate about this all the time. Right? They're not exactly sure what this, was in thorn, this, what this thorn was in Paul's life. Some have drawn the conclusion that it was actually Alexander the coppersmith who caused Paul a lot of harm. Maybe that was a thorn. Right? And you can find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And some of the more popular theories of the thorns interpretation include the temptations that Paul faced. Having chronic eye problems, malaria, migraines, epilepsy, and speech disability. Right, there's even a story of, uh, in Acts where Paul preached too long and a person was sitting on the windowsill listening to Paul. But he took too long. And you know what happened? Eutychus fell backwards. And you know what happened? He met the Lord that day. Not physically, but in eternity. And he died. And then I know that's like a weird story, but can you imagine if you're Paul, that moment reliving in your life over and over, that how that could haunt you? You see, no one knows what this thorn is. We can only speculate. But I know from my own experiences, my own personal experiences, as to what could be the equivalent of a thorn in my own life. It can be those moments we have our regrets because we've messed up. How many times have we said, God, I'm never going to do it again, only to find ourselves doing it again? How many times have we said, God, I want to be more loving only to find us to be so aggressive and so hateful. I mean, how many of us say, we, God, we want to change, and we make no efforts to change? But we have moments in our lives where we mess up, and that haunts us. We could, we could be filled with regrets. And for someone like Paul, he had a reputation and a past, and I'm sure that that followed him wherever he went. And people probably tried to use that against him. It's like, I know, you, I know you're, not, you're not Paul, you're Saul. I know, I know about you. You, you ain't changed. You, you used to lock us up, you used to persecute us, and now you're on our team. That is, nah, I can't trust you. Right? It's, it's like this. Think of it like this. It's like, think of a scenario like this. Right? If someone has a good reputation, somebody has a good track record, maybe they're a good student, maybe they're a good citizen, a great church member, whatever the, the case might be. And let's, let's say they mess up. They do something bad. What do we usually do for a person like that? We say like, oh, man, he's a good person. Or he's, he's a good kid. He's a, he's a good student. Man, people, people make mistakes. And we usually point to that, right? And that's usually the case, right? And that's what that highlights grace. But in, in the flip side is if someone has a past, and you can use your imagination as to what that past is. You can fabricate your own story. And then they get right, right? They come to know the Lord. They start to make changes in their lives. They're trying to better themselves in, because of, uh, as a result of knowing Jesus Christ. But before they can even make a mistake, what do we do? We bring out our shovels, and what do we do? Dig into the past. Right, we dig into the past, even though the person is changing in the present. And then the moment that they mess up, the moment that they slip up a little bit, what do we do? I knew, I knew he wasn't a good person. Right, I, I knew she couldn't be trusted. We go as far as saying it was only a, a matter of time. And the first scenario, grace is shown. And that's how we usually do it. In the second scenario, there's no grace. And for Paul, I would imagine that he was more gracious than what was shown to him. I'm sure people were so quick to bring up the past, criticize him, and pass judgment. The reality is, church, we all have a past. And I'm sure some of us in this room, we would be quite embarrassed if our past ever revealed itself here in this church. Because I think we, we appreciate and enjoy people knowing us in our current state. And we want, we want people to forget. However, the sufficiency of God's grace is that even though we have a past, 
we're still covered. Right? We are not disqualified. If anything, our past is actually an opportunity to further iterate just how good God is. Because look at it. How could God save a person like me? I don't know. But that will make, that's what makes God so good. Right? We are qualified because we have been redeemed, not because we've earned it or achieved it or, not, or even we're disqualified ourselves. You see, we can be harassed and you can still be covered. You can have a past and still be covered. Right? You can have a past and still be covered. Why? Because we are saved by grace and grace alone. Which brings me to my third point. Our weaknesses are opportunities to reveal God's worth. Our weaknesses are opportunities to reveal God's worth. In verse 9, Paul says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I don't want to jump too, too far into this because I feel like we all know this particular verse and we know it well. It actually speaks for itself. But we have to realize that our weaknesses, even though we might be ashamed of them, even though we want to hide them, even though we wish that no one would ever find out about our weaknesses, the reality is that our weaknesses are opportunities for us to reveal God's worth. How? How? Or why? You see, because despite all that we've done, all the bad, all the horrible things, right, despite our inconsistencies, guess who still loved you? God. I didn't love you. Now, I, loving you would be difficult. It would be hard. Let's be honest. But who still loved you? God. Who still pursued you? God, who still forgave you? God, who still showed you mercy? Who? Say it with me. God, thank you. Does that, does that not reveal just how amazing God truly is? Because even after doing all that, we still can't get it together. Even though we saved. Even though we're trying to, we're trying to improve and mature. And guess what? His grace... It's still there. It's still present. It is still active. And it is readily available to cover us and to comfort us. Right? We are still loved and we, we are still saved and we are still redeemed. That is what allows our weaknesses to continually reveal God's worth. Not just in our own lives, but the people around us. Right, think about how God's worth is revealed in what he is able to do and accomplish through our weaknesses, through our inabilities. Right, think about how God's worth is revealed in, in his still using us despite our sinfulness. And that's one of the things that you and I should be baffled by, that God will continually use you. And I'm obviously talking to myself in the mirror. I'm not like judging you, all right? But that's the reality of the situation. I mean, we do a good job. We come to church and we, we, we hide a lot of our, 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 our shortcomings, right? Right? Some of us have the mouth of a sailor, but we've never been in the Navy, right? We hide those things well. We come to church and we put our game faces on. And yet even still, we, we try to hide and can see all these things. Who still uses you? God. Is God's worth not displayed in you? And so the, the, the stronger that you get, guess who gets glorified even more? God. But yet even still in your weaknesses, God is still glorified. You see, in the sin, we turn from God to idols, which actually profane God. It destroys our faith, and it obscures God in the eyes of others. I mean, like, I don't want to be like, if that's what knowing God is like, I don't, I don't want to be like that. But weaknesses... But weakness has a tendency to increase our conscious dependence on God, which in turn continually glorifies Him. And as He is glorified and as He is being, as He is still using us and loving us, that actually strengthens our faith and that will continually manifest itself by manifesting God's power in, power in ways our strength can never do. 
And that's the surprising value of our weaknesses. They manifest God's power in us in ways that our strength don't. That's what Jesus meant when he told Paul, my power is made perfect in what? Say it with me. Weakness. There you go. Some of you like Coke Fuse, right? My power is made perfect in weakness. Not strength, but weakness. You see, our weaknesses are indispensable because God manifests the fullness of his power through them. Our weaknesses are opportunities for you and I to display just how great our God truly is. And you have your strengths. You have the things that you're great at. You have the things that you're consistent with. And those are amazing. While simultaneously the things that you are incapable of doing, the things that you are inconsistent with, the things that you are struggling with, equally are able to magnify just how great and amazing God is. And so church, allow your weaknesses to reveal God's worth in your life. Because when I am weak, he is what? And that means that you're not weak. Why? Because God is strong and who's covering you, who is embracing you, whose grace is hovering and flowing in you. It is not yours, it is God's. And so even though you're weak, you are actually strong. The last thing is this, God's grace allows for us to embrace suffering. In verse 10, right, lastly in verse 10, Paul says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with what? Weaknesses. And then he goes on to say, I'm okay with insults, hardships. I'm okay with persecutions and calamities. Why? Because in the midst of all of these things, even though they are a weakness, even though they trouble me, I'm okay. Why? Because then I am strong. Not because of my own strength, but because of God's strength. So not, only are we, so not only are we not alone, but we can embrace suffering because Christ suffered for us first. Right? We can embrace suffering and not be discouraged because experiencing suffering doesn't mean that I failed or that I've done something wrong. It doesn't leave us feeling powerless. Instead, because of God's grace, because of God's grace being truly sufficient, you and I can see suffering. We can view suffering in light of the cross and know that regardless of the outcome, meaning that you're successful or that you fail, we are saved. Not because of how good you did, which equally means that it's not taken away from you by how bad you were. Right? We are saved not by our works, but because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross, right? And it's by his stripes that we are what? Healed. Right? For the sake of Christ, I, whatever's coming my way, I'm going to be okay. God, I don't, I don't know what the future uh, uh, holds. God, I don't, I don't know what the storm is that's coming my way, but guess what? I'm going to be okay. Why? Because I realize that in my weaknesses, I'm actually strong. Not because I am reliant on my own strength, but I am reliant on whose strength? God. Church, God's grace for your life is what? Sufficient. It is more than enough. It is more than you will ever need. And it is there. It is readily available and so accessible God is just waiting to give it to you. God is waiting to allow that to overflow in your life. Your weaknesses, your struggles, your inconsistencies, see them not as a crutch or even as a punishment. Instead, I pray that they would be indicators, that there would be a flashing light going off in that thick skull of yours. That it would say, hey, hey, you need to trust God. And so, church, may we continually place our faith and trust in God, not because I'm relying on who I am, but because his grace is truly sufficient for my life. We are not weak, but by grace, by God's strength, you and I, together and individually, we are strong.
And so may we rely more and more on the grace of God each and every single day. May we not allow Satan to speak deceit into our lives to lead us astray, but may, that, may our weaknesses, may our struggles, may our, our persecutions be indicators that we need to draw ourselves closer and closer to God each and every single day because his grace is sufficient. You will not be met with judgment, but you will be welcomed with love and mercy. So may we continually cling to God. Let us pray.